All right. right so perfect. Can any? So I'm going to go ahead and work this. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Uh, it could be a little louder. All right. Let me move real close to the computer. <laughs> All right, so um, thank you for the uh, you opportunity the to um, present. I'm sorry for the uh, trouble here. We are uh, we had a massive snowstorm yesterday, um, but hopefully this will work out. So what I'm going to talk today about is work that's going on in my lab. So my lab is split roughly in three areas, metabolic engineering, which we'll talk a little bit about today, signal transduction, and then lastly looking at blood coagulation and trauma. And so what we're going to talk about today is the integration of metabolic engineering and signal transduction in the context of trying to understand how a model leukemia cell differentiates when I give it a nutritional cue. The work Today will be done by David Dye, who's a third year graduate student in our lab. He's the 2-2 element here on our people array. Um, so before we get started, though, on the specific details, what I'd like to do here is talk a little bit about why a chemical engineer is even interested in this. And this will give you some insight into, one, how how and where chemical engineers are involved in biology, but then also how we think about this problem. So our origin story in biology is, is goes back a ways. Um, you could go all the way back, for example, to Wiseman in the First World War, making acetone and butanol and castridium, or Merck in the Second World War, scaling up penicillin production. But if you look in more modern times, it was really this, this guy named Jay Bailey in the early 90s who um, was kind of an interesting, interesting fellow. He had come to biology uh, fairly late. He had worked at Shell for a number of years and then had gone back into academics and um, eventually wound his way to Caltech. And then he created the Institute for Systems Biology um, at molecular systems biology at ETH. But Jay in 91 thought, well, you know what we can do? We can do the same thing inside of a cell that we do when we try to optimize an oil refinery, and that's that we can rewire all the chemistry. So he came up with uh, this idea that, um, and coined this phrase called metabolic engineering, that I could harness the biosynthetic capability of, let's say, an E. coli cell, but then later on, uh, monkey around with cell cycle, and he got involved in engineering eukaryotic systems, and for some societal benefit. So the idea here was that I could, I could replace the biochemistry that was occurring inside of these cells or alter it in some way to produce a product of interest. But in the end, it, it, I, I got involved, uh, Jay was my postdoc advisor, and I got involved in, in the cancer world because Jay actually passed away from colorectal cancer. He had a primary tumor in, in his liver that had metastasized. And, but I took away the same, the same concept that I think about cells and I approach the modeling and analysis of cells as, as a large system of chemical reactions that we can manipulate in one way or another. So the way we approach this, if this were an oil refinery or if this were in a, uh, you know, inside of a cell, is that we write material balances, so we write mathematical models, and then we use these models to reason or to understand what's going on in the biology. So I'm going to talk today about one particular case study that does this, and that's looking at the uh, treatment of, of subtypes of leukemia with vitamin A or retinoic acid. This is work that's been going on in our lab for some time. As I mentioned, David's been working on this as his PhD thesis, but we've had this project going for 10 years now with Andy Yen, who is in uh, the biomedical sciences in our vet school here at Cornell Ithaca. So the backstory on this is, this goes back, this is a paper that Andy published in um, 87 now, so quite some time ago. But the backstory here is, is that if I take a, an HL60 cell, which is a human-derived 
human derived cell, immortalized cell line, but it does have some um, fidelity with, with uh, APL, and as well as interestingly, we've shown here recently AML on uh, a paper just published uh, a few weeks ago. But the backstory here is, is that I can take this, this uncommitted precursor cell and then I can treat it with some uh, agent. And that agent can be retinoic acid, vitamin A, or vitamin D. And this cell will differentiate. But it does it in a very interesting way. It does it in a two-stage way, where the first stage is the cell hasn't really made up its mind what it wants to do in terms of its lineage. So in this first stage, you can think about there must be some sort of set of circuits that are operating that say, okay, I'm going to prime the cell for differentiation, but I really haven't decided which lineage I'm going to take. And so that priming step takes about 24 hours. Following that, there is a lineage commitment step where the inducer you give actually matters. So in the priming step, I could give vitamin A and it would prime the cell. I could wash vitamin A out and then I could come in with some other inducer and uh, I could differentiate it into a different lineage. So vitamin A takes it to a neutrophil, vitamin D to a macrophage. And so in the first phase, it doesn't matter what the inducer is. So my, my priming circuit, it doesn't matter what it is. But in the second stage, it actually matters what the, what the inducer is. And so we got involved in this problem because it's a fantastically interesting control problem. And I wanted to understand sort of at a molecular level what was going on here. And so we started to think about, well, how could I build mathematical models of this and use these models to reason about the underlying networks? So these are what this class of models looks like. So this is uh, a, what a chemical engineer would do at Shell, for example, is we build material balances. If we look at the top part of the, of the slide here, we build material balances around the different metabolites or signaling processes that are occurring in the cell. And so each one of these balances describes, for example, the specific level of a, a metabolite, let's say glucose 6-phosphate inside the cell. And we have kinetics, um, kinetics as well as uh, in the green box there, the sigma term. This is the, the biological connectivity. So the kinetics would be the rate at which things are happening would be our V term there. And then when we talk about, you know, none of these reactions can occur unless we have uh, the, in the case of metabolism, unless we have the associated enzyme there. So we have to also think about the uh, transcription translation or TXTL balances, and these would be balances, the X's would be mRNA, and then polypeptide eventually maturing into protein. So we can, if you think about this, for every process that occurs in the cell, we write down some of these balances, but you saw that picture from KEG, and you, everybody knows that biology is you know, super, super complicated, so even in this, um, you know, relatively simple case when we have a single type of cells, uh, it's, it's a large, large system of, of equations that we have to write. So we need to start thinking about, well, are there ways that we can simplify this system, but still capture the core ideas of the biology? So we want to be able to use the models to still think about the biology and to, uh, to, to simulate the biology, but we, we can't have 12, you know, 15,000 differential equations and 30,000 unknown parameters, because that's roughly the, the scale that we're dealing with. And so the question that we, or the way we approach that we've taken here is we use a common tool in engineering time scale argument. So if we just look at our TXTL system of, uh, of equations here, that operates on a very slow time scale, but metabolism operates on a very fast time scale. So let me give you an example. So if we look, you know, classic experiment in E. coli, glucose lactose dioxy experiments from the late 60s, if you look at the time scale it takes for an E. coli cell to switch from glucose to lactose, it's on order 50 minutes. Okay, now there's a lot of stuff happening in that 50 minutes. 
But if you were to dig down, for example, and look at the time constant for lac Z initiation, so the time it takes for me just to start making making components of my lac, of my, the lac operon, that's on order minutes. So lac Z initiation has been measured and that's about six minutes. Contrast that with the time it takes for phosphofructokinase to uh, the time constant for its chemistry, and it's six orders of magnitude faster than transcription and translation. So if, if I were uh, a gene, and I'm looking around in the cell, metabolism appears to be frozen. So I'm moving, and if I were on the time scale of metabolism, the gene expression appears to be moving at sort of a geologic time scale. So we can use this idea to break these two things apart and then treat them independently of one another to a degree, which we'll see. So let's focus first on the transcription and translation. So we started to think about, well, what's the architecture of this, of this uh, circuit in, in the HL60 cells, and in particular, the priming circuit? So the way this circuit works is if I prime the cells, I can pull them out of the inducer, come back later, add in another, you know, spin them down, take them out of the inducer. The HL60 is great to work with. It's sort of the E. coli of uncommitted precursor cells, grows, it's it's, uh, you know, has a pretty good growth rate, it's pretty hardy. So I can spin this thing down and then come back later and then add in a completely different inducer and it will, it will then differentiate to that lineage. But it has a memory that has been primed. So we started to think about, well, what, what type of archi circuit architectures would give me memory? And so the diagram on the, on the my left, and I'm facing the screen, so your left, this is what's known as a, a, a memory motif. And the idea here is, is that if I, just this simple example, if I have three proteins, I have an inducer that activates protein one, then protein one activates both two and three, but then two and three activate each other. What we can do is we can withdraw the inducer and this system will stay locked on. Okay, so when we are modeling the different transcription and translation processes, we need to come up with a uh, rates of transcription and translation. And believe it or not, in E. coli, or excuse me, in HL60 cells, there is quite a lot of information, for example, about number of polymerases and time constants and so forth. There's a lot of, been a lot of biophysics work done there because it's, it's an easy cell to work with. And so we can write these mechanistic, what we call promoter rule or transcription rule functions. And, and, and these are the mathematical way that we can describe the forces that are either promoting or inhibiting um, gene expression. And not to belabor the math here, but the way to think about it is the numerator is all possible promoter configurations that lead to expression. And then denominator is all possible configurations. And so what you're getting here is in the numerator, that's the fraction, if you can think about it in a probabilistic sense, that's the fraction of events that will lead to transcription divided by all possible events. So we can, we can identify or estimate the parameters that appear in these promoter functions from different type of experimental data. So if we look here at just a quick, some quick simulations of this, of this memory circuit, we focus here on the, on the left, so if we have the memory circuit and I withdraw the inducer, so the inducer shown in the red here at the bottom, protein one will decay. I'm in a growing cell, growing population here. So will not only will it dilute, but it will also, the message will eventually decay. But protein two and protein three stay activated, even in the absence of inducer. So there's a memory. If I break any component of that positive feedback, the uh, program fails. So we use this simple idea and this simple structure to uh, model our HL60 cells. So we developed a, uh, a, a model here that we published, uh, actually a reduced order model that we published not too long ago here last year. We had actually done a very detailed mechanistic model of this a few years ago now that had uh, about 800 differential equations in it. And that's, um, so it was a massive, very, very detailed. 
And this one, on the other hand, does about the same thing, but it has about 60. And there are some interesting mathematics about how we can describe things in different ways and reduce the dimension down. But let's just focus right now on these three different sort of modules. And the first module is our priming module. And so what's happening is here is we take a priming signal, in this case, vitamin A. That vitamin A signal gets processed and it, produce, it produces an initiation signal that we call trigger. And then that trigger activates this signaling complex called sig the signal zone. Now, we're still trying to figure out what's, what's the, the different players in the signal zone, but there are a couple key players that we're going to talk about today. One of them is a G-coupled protein receptor called BLR1, otherwise known as CXCR5. Another is, um, Lou knows very well, is actually PI3K is involved in this signal zone. And then there are other, uh, other, um, other factors, Lynn, Figure, uh, some Sark family kinases. So this is kind of a hairball right now. But, but this thing forms, and what it does is it promotes the, the ex, uh, activation of CRAF, and in particular the phosphorylation of CRAF at, at a kind of a weird site, serine 621. And then that serine 621 uh, site phosphorylated RAF. It does a couple things in the cell, but it does it goes through the normal uh, RAF mech ERP cascade, but it also can act a, it, on its on its own, will translocate to the nucleus and act as a transcription factor or will have a phosphorylation activity in the nucleus, which is a little bit blasphemous in the MAPK world. But if we think about this, this um, this Signal zone activates MAPK. MAPK then will go and it will drive the expression of, of components of the signal zone, but then also components of the, of the phenotypic program. So we have a positive feedback loop that gives the cell a memory, which is shown in the signal initiation module. And then our trigger signal uh, will activate a bunch of different stuff in what we call the signal integration module. And some of these you'll notice are, you know, very common um, lineage uh, determining transcription factors, for example, PU, PU1 or PPAR. Um, so these fellows then will, uh, again, there's a lot of interaction, but in the end, they will drive the phenotypic program. So our initiation module is, is uh, the the uh, lineage um, priming module, the integration and the phenotype are the uh, lineage specification module. So we, we asked ourselves, okay, uh, well, could we describe what's going on with this, with this sort of simple, simple model of what's going on? Could we describe experimental data? So if we focus on the panel on the left, we see, for example, um, panel A and B. These are simulations versus data for the level of one of these signal zone components. In this case, it's the mRNA of uh, BLR1, uh, the sort of anchor of the signal zone. And then panel B is the serine 621 phosphorylated CRAF. One interesting bit here is, uh, for those of you who are into MAPK signal, you'll notice that this is a sustained signal and this signal is sustained over multiple generations. So the, uh, the, the doubling time of E. coli, is, excuse me, of, of HL60 is approximately uh, 20 hours. And you can see that this signal is sustained over 100 hours, which is kind of an interesting. Um, and it, and it, instead of encoding for uh, super growth, it actually encodes for arrest. So these cells will G0 arrest and then differentiate. This system is bistable. It was predicted to be bistable. So that means, if we, for example, if we focus on panel C, if I look at the signal zone abundance versus CRAF, depending upon where I start in this, in this phase plane, I will either become, I either will be activated or I will decay to, uh, I will no longer be activated. If we, and that's for uh, atra, so retinoic acid thresh uh, below some critical threshold. If we have retinoic acid above a critical threshold, we're always activated. We can actually observe this threshold um, and at least get an approximate idea of where it's at by just simple morphological studies, which are shown in panel E. 
And it turns out that this threshold is somewhere around 0.25 micromolar. And all the experiments that we're going to talk about for the rest of, of uh, this section of the talk, we're going to be at one micromolar. So we're way above the, uh, the, the activation threshold. So if you focus on panels F and G, these are some simulations of, of what's going on, uh, both time dependent. So we're looking at marker uh, expression. So the uh, lines are the, and the regions are the simulations, and then the dots are the points. These are two markers, CD38, which is an early marker of retinoic acid-induced expression, and CD11B, which is a little bit later. Lastly, we can uh, capture, at least on a, in a qualitative sense, the shift in expression uh, for relative to the control in our, for components of our signal initiation and, pardon me, our, our uh, signal processing and phenotypic program modules. Okay, so we um, do a pretty good job there, actually. So we can then run some, run some uh, pure predictions and, and just to try to test this notion of the architecture. So one of them is, for example, and I mentioned in the simple uh, case when we were looking at the memory circuit, if I do something to break the feedback, I should... I should either completely destroy the memory or I should lower, um, lower the signal. So we did an experiment here where we looked at different levels of a MAPK inhibitor and our readout was the uh, mRNA BL level <coughs> BL1. And so different, um, two different inhibitors, for example, we can lower the amount of signal zone. Now this is interesting because remember MAPK is upstream of uh, BLR1 expression. So this shows that uh, we have, we're closing this loop. We can also show something similar. If we were to delete BLR1, um, we will, the cells will not differentiate. So um, I, I, I no longer have signal zone formation, so I cannot, I break the top branch of the feedback. And then lastly, one of the things that the, um, that the phase plane or that the bistability suggests is if I start in a system that's in the stable state, so if I, if I give my cells uh, B, or ATRA, RA, retinoic acid, above the threshold and I let them prime, if I withdraw them, they should have a memory of that priming. So what we can do then is wash out the um, prime them, so we can prime them for 24 hours and then take them out of, uh, take them out of retinoic acid and then see if they can, uh, if they maintain their activated state. And so we do this washout experiment, which is shown here in panel C, and we can see phosphorylated ERK for, um, you know, up past 120 hours uh, of, of experimental time, and remember that the division cycle for HL60 is only uh, approximately 20, 20 hours. So we are we have a sustained activation over that long period of time. So this suggests to us that this simple architecture of this positive feedback shows that if we're if we start in the locked activated state we'll stay in the activated state now the, it's not perfect though because if you looked at our simulations we do uh, versus data for example with blr1 we do miss the program shutting off for a long time so we're doing a pretty good job with the initiation but not a great job with understanding you know how the program turns off we can then go in and start to play around and knock things out of the network, and this just shows uh, what we call robustness analysis, where we did every possible pairwise interaction, and then did singular value decomposition, and just looked at, well, which pairs are driving the response of my system, and it's not surprising that well-known regulators of, of lineage are driving uh, this, this system, so GIF1 as well as PPARG. Now, the interesting thing about GIF1 GFI1, pardon me, is that it was not upregulated in uh, retinoic acid-treated cells. So, it, so this suggests that the basal level of this transcription factor is important in our signal um, integration module. Okay, 
So the last thing on, on this side of the talk is, well, you know, great. So it looks like we can, we can do, we can cause these cells to, to differentiate. This has been used clinically for different APLs. Why don't, you know, why isn't this uh, a broad-based therapy? The issue is resistance. So resistance in a couple ways. Uh, one is, is that eventually um, these cells will develop what we call retinoic acid syndrome. So they will essentially not differentiate anymore. They will ignore the signal. So we've, we've uh, been able to develop two emergent retinoic acid resistant lines. They are completely different in terms of their signaling. And so we're spending uh, a lot of effort now. We published this first in 2013 and we've been publishing papers ever since then trying to characterize these cells. And so we, we initially were excited by this being uh, potentially clinically important because it was a, it was a model of uh, retinoic acid resistance. That's become uh, come up a, a little bit more to the fore now because we found out that we can actually rescue these cells by adding retinoic acid in combination with something else. And in this particular case, it's a, it's a kinase inhibitor called PP2, but there are other agents. And the interesting bit about this is we can add the same agents to cells that are natively resistant should, that should differentiate. So for example, AML, it should work with retinoic acid, but it, retinoic acid alone, it will not differentiate. But if you add it in combination, it will with with um, again. There's a, a variety of different uh, different com combinations. It will actually differentiate, and we just showed this, uh, albeit in a small patient population at 12 samples from Monica Guzman's lab at at Weill Cornell. That was just published in OncoTarget here, like a, two weeks ago. Okay, so if we step back, what we've done here is we've we've we developed a, a mathematical modeling framework that allows us to build these, these models of a signal transduction that's occurring when we add retinoic acid. They're manageable from, uh, from a size perspective, and they allow us to interrogate what's going on and take some, you know, try to understand the, the circuit architecture. But what we haven't done here is consider anything to do with metabolism. Now, why were we interested in metabolism? As I mentioned earlier on, the signal zone, one of the, one of the key players in the signal zone is PI3K. And it's been known for quite some time that retinoic acid will activate PI3K, actually the PI3K AKT signaling axis, because it can act through C CFIMS receptors, for example, um, PDGFR family re receptors. So you are activating, uh, activating this signaling axis, which is, which is tied, into, tied into metabolism. And the other interesting bit here is that we have, with some studies, we have shown that, that HL60, we haven't done it in the primaries yet, but HL60 is a, uh, is a Warburg-like cell. So meaning it, it consumes glucose, it consumes glutamate, and it produces quite a lot of lactate. So it's got an altered cell, central carbon metabolism. The last piece of information that we have, we've done some assays for flow cytometry that look at intracellular glucose levels and depending upon the, the, the so treated cells, resistant cells, so responsive, resistant, and rescued cells all have different glucose profiles inside the cell. So be, taken together, we're interested to understand how metabolism is involved in our differentiation program beyond just paying in a, in a you know energy and building blocks way for all the gene expression that's occurring. So if we revisit our our time scale argument here, we can rethink about well now we have beyond just our transcription and translation. So beyond just our dx dt terms, we've got all of our metabolite balances. So all of our central carbon metabolite balances, and and these these are at a approximate or pseudo steady state if we're operating on the time scale of gene expression. So how do I solve or estimate the for the fluxes, so this these V terms here, and I'm sorry I can't point, I'm pointing to my screen, but you can't see that. Um, so these, these V terms in the gray, these are the fluxes, metabolic fluxes, so flow 
through my metabolic network, and I want to be able to estimate these. So what's traditionally done here is we do something called a constraints or constraint-based model, otherwise known as flux balance analysis. And so I wanted to kind of just step back here a minute and look at what, what FBA is. And so this idea is, imagine I have this little toy cell here, and I've got some metabolites A, B, and C in the cell, and they're interconnected with some enzymatic reactions. I'm taking A up, I'm spitting both C and B out. And the question is, if I had measurements of A, of Q1, Q2, and Q3, so that's the rate at which we are putting A into the cell and the rate of byproduct formation, could I estimate the fluxes, so the V1 through 4, inside the cell? And the way this problem gets done is we propose the, 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 the metabolic network is encoded in something in the green thing here called a stoichiometric array where the different metabolites are along the, uh, are the rows and the different reactions are the columns. And I make a pseudo steady state approximation, at least traditionally, uh, for intracellular metabolites. And what that practically means is if I make a unit of A inside the cell, it cannot accumulate. It's got to be used somewhere. And so we have then a system of algebraic equations where my unknowns are, is the flux vector, this thing in the peach over here. But if you look, I have one, two, three, four. I have, even if I knew Q1, Q2, Q3, I have four unknowns and I have three equations. So this is a uh, common problem. It is underdetermined. So, we so have Jeff, to this is your five-minute uh, five warning, okay? Yep, got it. So, so we have to do a uh, traditional, uh, the way this is traditionally done is to set up, to solve these problems using something called a linear program, where we propose a, um, a objective function, for example, to maximize growth, and then a set of biological constraints. The key problem with this is, is that when we do this, we get rid of all metabolite information in the cell. So that's the downside. The upside is this is very efficient. I can solve this for genome scale models, even for models of uh, at, at you know human genome scale. So there's, for example, as a human reconstruction called Recon 2.2 that's it's got you know approximately 10,000 uh, reactions in it now. So we did FBA here on um, on our our little system of interest, so our HL60, and in panel A here we we've, we've developed some uh, LC mass spec methods to measure metabolites outside the cell. So I'm just showing here glucose and lactate. We can also measure glutamine versus, and then cell count versus time for treated and untreated. The interesting thing from this data is that the treated cells, um, their, the growth rate slows down, which you might imagine because a fraction of the population is um, arresting. The glucose the specific glucose uptake rate, so meaning amount of glucose consumed per cell, actually stays the same. I just have fewer cells. Lactate increases. We know that these metabolic differences are because of differenti differentiation, because we can monitor, for example, level CD38 on, on the cells. So if we look here in panel C, this is you know, a, a flux diagram. And the big picture to take away from here is, is that we can estimate these fluxes this is again the flow of carbon and energy through this network, and this um, when I when I give retinoic acid, the uh, glutamine uptake kicks up, lactate production kicks up. I do not have a complete TCA cycle. I have activity through something called NADP-dependent malic enzyme, which funnels TCA intermediates to pyruvate, and pyruvate goes back out of the mitochondria. And I see some other uh, interesting. <coughs> metabolic reprogramming here that's going on. So now the question that we've been uh, trying to get at is how much of this is real? And so we've been proposing, we've been starting to develop what are called C13 um, labeling studies where we can feed different labeled, either C13 labeled glucose or C13 labeled glutamine to come up with a better idea of what the actual flux distribution inside the cell is. So I'm going to quickly go through this. One of the issues that, that I mentioned with traditional constraints-based analysis is that we get rid of all metabolite values. So what happens if we don't make the pseudo steady state assumption? 
So if we don't do that, then we have what we call a DIP problem, which is discrete integrated physiological programming. And so this allows us to, um, to do a lot of really interesting things, but in particular, it allows us to get time dependent transcription and translation and time dependent metabolite information from inside the cell. So this is just a little toy system that to illustrate this. So for example, if we focus on the top panels here, I've got a intermediate, uh, excuse me, I have an extracellular substrate A that's being processed by the cell through this, through this operon here. And we can have time dependent or staggered gene expression and then time dependent metabolite levels. So this algorithm is uh, slightly more complicated from a computational perspective. It requires that we, for example, we write a specialized differential equation solver, and, but it does offer the upside that we get metabolites and we can also study nonlinear problems, which do arise in practice. So the last thing I'm gonna leave you with here is, is that we've started to apply this DIP algorithm to our uh, cell, to our HL60 cells. I'm just showing you the control fluxes here at t equal 36 hours. So this is right in the middle of, of uh, when we're, we're growing exponentially, but we have not added retinoic acid. And the pattern is similar to what we saw with FBA. However, there are a few differences here or there, um, but, the, but the big pattern is the same. So where are we going from here? So the future directions that we want to be able to integrate the signaling program that I showed you in the first vignette of the talk with our dip calculation of metabolism. So this, this integration is twofold. Firstly, we'll be able to describe on a sequence specific basis the cost, so the metabolic burden associated with transcription and translation of the, of the phenotypic program. Secondly, we'll be able to tie into the potential regulatory interactions between the signal zone and, and our and signal zone activation and the metabolism. And the first area that we're looking at is looking at hexokinase 2 phosphorylation states. This is known in different cell types to be phosphorylated by AKT. HK2 is expressed in, in um, HL60. Then the next, as I mentioned, we have to get better and better at our ability to estimate these fluxes inside the cell. And so we need to be able to simulate the program that's leading to not only the expression of all of our phenotypic program, but all of our just the plain Jane um, metabolic, you know. So how is, what's the regulation of, of hexokinase two or phosphoproctokinase and so forth, both at the transcription level as well as at the allosteric level. With the dip calculation, we can get at both. In the end, what we hope is that we have this integrated model and we can screen that like we did before and look for points of fragility that lead to resistance. So with that, I'm gonna conclude. I wanna thank, uh, thank you again for the opportunity to speak. And I wanna thank the uh, NIH uh, and the Nash, uh, excuse me, and the uh, Army as well as the NSF to su for support of this work. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Maybe I'll uh, start out the questions myself. Yeah. That's uh, you know really uh, interesting modeling. Um, I, and I noticed your lactate came out to be more than twice the glucose going in, yeah. which explains your conclusion, glutamine must be contributing carbons there. Obviously, if you put C13 labeled glutamine or glucose, you could uh, further refine that system a bit uh, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, get some better confidence. Have you uh, tried doing that? Yeah, we're doing that right now. So we have developed a, um, so the, so we have a single quad mass spec in our lab, but it's an LCMS. And so most of the protocols right now are GCMS. And the difference is not just the separation, but the LCMS the MS part is electrospray, so it has a hard time breaking the carbon-carbon bonds. Um, we have worked with our facility or with our biotech center here. Um, they just getting a brand new, really nice GC mass spec in um, that should be online actually next week. So the first experiment we're going to do is actually C1 labeled glucose because it's going to give us information. I didn't talk about this, but in the dip calculation, we show um, cycling through pentose phosphate pathway. So 
Um, this is going to give us a better idea of what the G6, how many times these, how many times we travel through PPP, and and do we even have that level of PPP flux? I mean, FBA, you have to be careful interpreting FBA um, fluxes themselves. So another thing to to get at this question is. It will actually help us with the labeling as well, the picking of the tracers, is that we're doing uh, what's called an FVA, so flux variability analysis, which gives you an idea. Is It's a calculation that's conceptually simple. I, I have to always meet my experimental objective, or ex experimental constraints, which is glucose uptake, growth rate, lactate secretion, and then coming online, <clears throat> we just got our glutamate assay um, checked out. So these have to be have to be the case, but FBA will, has alternative minima, alternative optima. So we're going to search through these alternative optima and figure out the range that each flux each flux in the network can have, but still satisfy those constraints. So some of them are going to be tightly constrained, but I I can imagine, for example, the pentose phosphate just from experience that's going to be all over the place. So that's the hence the first um, the C1 labeled glucose. That's good. Uh, which, of, of course, you could also trap that uh, CO2 that comes off from the oxidative. Yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah. But you'd probably need radioactive to really do that well. Yeah, we don't, we're not set up, we can't do that. <laughs> yeah. So one other uh, question I had about uh, the, this interesting uh, comment you made about CRAF going into the nucleus uh, and uh, the as, as we know, these sites that AKT phosphorylates, and in the case of BRAF, A and PK phosphorylates, one of the sites for 14.33 binding as well. Yeah. And those can all influence the complex formation with MEC uh, and, and the scaffolding. Uh, so, is it? Uh, are you arguing that the phosphorylation by AKT is is disrupting that complex or supporting that complex, or neither? <laughs> Did I lose you? I, I think I think uh, you were only allowed uh, forty minutes, <laughs> and you've been cut off. So I don't know if you can hear me or not, but I, I think we will. Uh, oh, okay. I can hear you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. We we couldn't hear you. Uh, anyway, that's. Um, I don't know if you heard my question or not. But, I'm sorry. But Short answer, lost. we're interested in BRAF. We haven't done much with it. Okay. 